Good turnout today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, if you weren't in last week's session, um, I'm Hannah Jackson. I'm Head of School Programmes here at New Schools Network. Thank you for joining us for our second uh, event in this series of uh, DfE Partner Events. Uh, and today we're talking uh, about site and preparing for the final stages uh, of getting your site ready uh, and handover, whatever that might look like. Um, I think it's just worth saying um, that site is one of those areas where everybody's experience will be slightly different. Uh, I know some of you are opening in temporary accommodation and that might look slightly different depending on whether you're going into a temporary build or opening in one of your trust's existing schools, for example, which I know is quite common. Um, and I know that a few of you are opening through the local authority uh, presumption route uh, as well. So we're trying to cover um, quite a lot of ground today and making sure that everybody is able to get something out of today's session. If you're not sure if something applies to you in your context, please do just put a question uh, in the chat and we'll make sure that gets clarified. Um, but do bear with us, there might be things that aren't quite as relevant to you um, but hopefully we'll come around uh, and make sure that there are things uh, that answer all your questions about your particular circumstances. So we've got two speakers today. I'm really pleased to be joined by Ron Rampling, uh, a project director at the Department for Education. He'll be talking us through sort of the more technical uh, aspects of the next few months and the post uh, handover uh, operational side of things. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from Georgette Ailing, head teacher at Bohunt Horsham, uh, which is an all through school uh, in Sussex um, that has just moved into uh, its permanent site. So Georgette, I'm sure, has the, the gamut of experience um, and she'll be able to share her top tips and lessons learned from that experience over the last few years. So I think we've got most of uh, the people on the call who'll be joining us today. Um, please do just put questions in the chat as we go through and I'll make sure that those are fed through to our speakers. But without further ado, um, Graham, I'll ask you to bring up the slides and hand over to Ron. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Ron Rampling. I'm a project director in Free Schools Capital for the DFE at the moment. Um, I've been coming to these sessions for about two years now uh, to try and talk to schools over a range of issues around our capital journey. And I know that you're, all of you are in the process of um, uh, preparing for the opening of your new free school this year. I didn't realise there were um, schools that were opening in temps as well, Hannah, but that's good to know because some of this stuff is very relevant still to everything about the experience of opening in temps and some of it won't be. But assuming you're moving on to a permanent building, uh, it's, it's also useful information as well. So I've been a project director for about six years in free schools. And in that time, I've opened with this process about 35 to 40 schools. Um, they're all different, <laughs> they're all great fun, uh, and they're all uh, um, uh, a nightmare at the same time. So uh, what we try and aim to do with you is make it as smooth as possible and as successful as possible for all of you. So um, I'm going to really rattle through this uh, because I know that you don't want to just have a talking shop with, with me doing all the talking. You want questions and interaction. And there is lots of information here, which I will probably skim through, but it will be available to you. And um, there is a lot of information there that you might want to take uh, uh, some careful consideration of and some good links to other useful information as well. So don't worry if, um, if, if I skim over something you want to ask about. And if you do, please ask, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Should we have the next slide then? Um, very quickly, uh, it, it, again, on the basis that uh, you're all in different stages towards handover and accepting your new building, what we have is a fairly standard process. It's supposed to be Whitehall cover, um, Whitehall um, uh, 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 comprehensive against all government departments, but there is a degree of flexibility in it. So you may or may not experience all of these stages. But about six months from the, the planned handover to you, you should be getting a detailed letter from your project directors um, that outline the process and outline the responsibilities that the trust will have in preparing for the handover and what it entails. And then that countdown commences 
and um, the, the the various state the various pieces of activity the various work streams for that um, uh, are are developed so that around three months out um, you get an update on that and another reminder about the things you need to do and I know because in the audience there's one school that I hope was get, we're going to smoothly move towards handover at Easter which I've just issued that letter to them so um, we we find it a useful reminder and I hope it keeps trust engaged on what they need to be doing and preparing for because it is quite a, a heavy uh, a heavy um, period of activity and there's lots of preparation required so again depending on the nature of the scheme um, in the last month there will be frantic activity to close out any snags um, issues defects incomplete works on the building uh, and the site involved and that you'll be getting um, invited to actually look around the building and, and assess what you think um, in terms of the quality, in terms of whether or not it's a snag, it's a paint mark, um, or is it an acceptable uh, uh, piece of work to, to roll over into a post handover exercise um, of, of redress for, for those little snags. Um, th those sort of discussions will be taking place to involve the trust and something I'm going to say throughout is you need to make sure that you've got the right people doing that, that you've got a building management, a facilities management um, uh, person who's relatively well experienced, um, that as experienced as possible to help you with all that. None of this should be a burden that falls upon the principal um, uh, exclusively. This is very much a buildings and estate exercise. So the, 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 the process we go through is quite document heavy. So there will be quite a lot of documentation and you'll see on the next slide that certification, formal certification of everything that is in that building and the building itself is needed to ensure safety for, before it can be handed over to the trust on the day itself. All of those certificates will have to be exhaustively checked. All of the, the um, services, all of the systems of the building will have to be checked, inspected, and passed as well before handover can happen and it's a bit of a, um, a bureaucratic exercise but it ensures the safety uh, and, and, and the, the effective operation of the building once you get it and something I'm going to say all throughout is this is a, a journey not a destination that once you get that building it's absolutely vital that you know how to operate it properly. Um, think about a car um, you need to know you need to have read the, the, the operational manual and you'll need to know how to drive it once you take possession of it from the showroom or whatever. It's absolutely vital that from day one, it's a safe building that you have expertise in operating. And I'll come on to that a bit later. Do you want to have, um, let's click to the next slide. Graham. So on the handover day, like I said, there needs to be formal certification, industry recognized certification that the building is safe and that the building is complete against the contractor requirements that we set the builder um, in, in our contract for them. So there might be some issues which you should know about full well that the building contract will not provide for you. But that should have been something that's talked through with you in great detail so you know exactly what it is that you should expect from the satisfaction of the um, of, our, of our building contract and there will be certifications of all of the uh, mechanical and electrical systems um, certifications around building safety and a practical completion certificate which is the big certificate that says that the building and, and the screen is ready for it to be handed over to you and all of those things need to be in place before the handover takes place but what you'll also note is that this is very much a multi-agency responsibility. So aside from our technical advisors, um, the contractor has got great obligations in terms of providing stuff and that the making sure that they have trained the appropriate staff in the trust fully for operation. But also the trust will have its own responsibilities for this, that it needs to ensure insurance, that its own fire strategy, is in place usually as a travel plan that's required as well a number of things that must be delivered by the trust as part of that effort towards handover and the issues that we have to um, handle as well around legal obligations 
to the landlord um, if it's not outright bought by the DfE um, and owned by the Secretary of State it might be a, um, an obligation to a landlord which continues to be the local authority so it's a multi-agency effort and it takes a lot of work and there's a lot of paperwork involved but the trust has a really really important job itself within that it's not something that's done to you um, and if you go to the next slide Graham you can see that what, what a lot of those uh, points are so these are things you can take away but um, uh, there are two pages of this and these are also recited in those letters I, I mentioned that you get six months and three months beforehand but um, just just looking at a few of them it's really important you've got a facilities manager that understands what are very very complex systems these days very complex systems with an awful lot of software um, analysis and, and building management systems in them and um, they are usually um, a good person to have around in what's called the soap test which is where at the end of the project when everything's installed the contractor will run the systems at full full stretch to make sure that they all work properly so um, having someone who can actually observe that who can get engaged in that along with our technical people means that they will understand how the system operates uh, once you've got possession of the building you have to have as the trust insurance uh, for the building from that day of handover and any of the equipment that arrives as well and in the case of ict equipment a lot of that will be coming before you hand over so there might be issues about how that's insured because technically our contractor doesn't have to insure that stuff so it's a discussion that you'll need to have and be clear about what you're going to do about that you need to make sure that fire safety and fire strategy is all rehearsed and in place um, whether or not you, that our contractors providing um, fire uh, uh, equipment or in in the school or not if it's usually provided by you that that might be a an unknown it might get lost in in the discussions and you, you might end up where the contractor hasn't provided them and you haven't got them so just make sure that things like that are clear and and it's always your responsibility as you know to book in and um, commission the telecoms and broadband provider for your school so more practical things telling parents making sure the keys are labeled and you do a practice run so your caretaker or fm manager will understand what to lock and how and where so you you can actually get in and out of the building and make it safe at the end of the day as well do things like that and very much important again staff induction training as well as the training on operating and interrogating the building systems um, just having to use it as well um, by staff is, is very important taking ownership of the spaces is one thing but just knowing where things are how things work what security arrangements are all that should be done by your contractor beforehand and you shouldn't um, go into uh, accepting the building if it hasn't been. Um, there's another slide, uh, the same sort of tips. Next up. So yeah, again, fire evacuation, fire safety, fire drills, down to you um, and your liaison with emergency services. Uh, and the biggest issue of all is safeguarding as well. You will want to ensure that everything about the building and the site is safe, secure, and that you do your own assessment of that we'd like i think that you do that as handover or prior handover takes place but i know there are some schools that want to um, take a longer look at these buildings once handover is taken before they actually move in and start operating um catering uh obviously you'll have a full production kitchen but who how 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 that production takes place and the contracts uh, uh and how they work will usually be entirely with the trust and yeah resilience um it is it is quite a uh, a tense uh, and exciting time and it takes a lot of work and there are a lot of frustrations in it um and if you've done this before you'll know that but um it the reward is when we all leave <laughs> get off the site and leave you with the keys in the building okay so you know again lots of information much more information about all of those are available um, take them away and come back with questions if you wish. So how am I doing for time? Okay. Um, right, so the handover day itself will be a process of going through a checklist which is pages long to ensure that everything 
in terms of um, the requirements of the contract is in place and everything in as regards the requirements of your day-to-day -day operation and the safety of the building and the staff and pupils is in place but but what we say all the time and with increasing emphasis now is that you sh you need to look at this as a continuum so you you're preparing not just for the handover but much more importantly for the operation of the building itself driving it away and driving it away safely for um the the, the rest of the life of that building so you will have a full suite of documentation to assist you and that's a critical important um, product of the handover process and that's called an operation and maintenance manual and a set of drawings and a set of documentation that shows you how each component of that building will work for you and what potential services you might also have associated with the operation of the building and, and the um, establishment and maintenance of the external space as well. So it should be everything you need to see. And increasingly over the years, we've been trying to tighten up the quality of that. So you just don't get six bo cardboard boxes with paper in it. You get a usable interrogatable document in, in a form that's either a USB stick or, or CDs as, it, as, as they used to be provided, or even um, a written document if you so wish. So you'll get all of that. And once handover has taken place on that day, that you'll find that there will be a full one year period where the, the um, free schools capital team will stay involved in um, liaising with our contractor on any defects that emerge. So we'll be chasing any work that is not yet completed. There are small snags in most schools that are uh, left over from a handover. There's hardly any schools. I think there's one in my lifetime where there was a perfect handover of a school that didn't have any issues at all with it um, once it was given over to the, to the, the school. Um, that defects period is a period where the contractor will come back and address all the problems that are raised through a process of um, usually a help desk system that the trust is briefed on and that we'll, we as DfE will continue to liaise and chase our contractor on, on those things. And you'll find that that can actually be quite um, a, a, a light touch exercise with a, a meeting every three months, a, a every quarter where there's hardly anything to chase. Uh, and the unlucky um, schemes where it is more intensive and there's a lot more activity, it'll be once a month maybe. But at the end of that year, once those defects are all closed out and, and after a period of a one year, the contractor will usually come back and do a wholesale refresh of some of the areas where the plaster is cracked, things like that. That's always planned for the end of that year, so it can happen over a holiday period. At the end of that year, all of the responsibility for maintenance of the building and dealing with the contractors and warranties for all the aspects of the building in terms of what guarantees you've got for their good operation, that all reverts to the trust and that you are then um, the sole uh, responsible body for dealing with those issues. And what we're asking is that um, trusts aware of this start to practice and use good estate management, which is a very extensive resource that DfE has set up um, on gov.uk. And we've got links to um, uh, on, on this set of slides as well. So think of it as a journey. It's not the, the end point isn't handover. You should be thinking about steady state, a great building that is operating perfectly for you over the longer term. Next slide. So yeah, just to, just to remind what I was saying there, um, you will get a guide um, aimed at facilities management, which is either a facilities manager, uh, which is a qualification and a detailed experience person, or your caretaker, uh, and, and we'd hope that they're as ex experienced as possible. You'll get a guide, which is a general guide about um, these, these uh, operational issues uh, at or before the handover aimed at that person. It's worth it at the principal and the senior leadership have a look at it, but it's aimed at that technical person. You will, as part of the handover, um, get a detailed schedule 
and this is a prescription that we say every contractor must provide a detailed schedule about which parts of the building need to be looked after in what way and in terms of what maintenance regime they have to be looked after. So the, the guttering, for instance, there'll be a maintenance schedule that says you should clean out those things every three months, perhaps. Usually that's the case. And the, the point of that is you do that every three months as a maintenance, planned maintenance program, so that the, the, the roof doesn't develop faults and then the roof causes you an enormous bill in terms of a capital rectification job. So it's all about good practice. It's all about doing a, a sensible routine, which is not very costly to avoid significant costs later on and disruption to your staff and pupils, more importantly. Um, so, so those things will be included in our prescriptive operation and maintenance manuals. And that's a critical document, like I said, coming in, in the form that you wish and it's, it's mainly aimed at FM managers, but there is a section of it which is aimed at principals as well. So a uh, very important document and make sure that your team is aware that that should be developing uh, and you should be aware of it as well as you move towards a handover. Um, the GEMS resource is what I mentioned before, the estate management resource that DFE has set up now. And uh, we'll come on to that in the second for you to have a look at. And, what we will be doing as DFE is encouraging you regularly to try and develop uh, a, a longer term view about the uh, what's called estate management, which is how to best look after the building and the, and the, uh, the estate that you've got as a result of delivering this school. OK. <clears throat> so. The, the, usually on these calls, we have a colleague from this team within DFE um, who, who would actually go through this, uh, um, this website. It's a very, very detailed set of resources aimed purely at trusts in terms of giving that or, or academies or individual schools or local authority schools. Any school that has a responsibility for looking after a building. Um, of whatever type that does include that would include a temporary facility as well if you're in attempts for a year even though it's still meant to be by its nature replaceable at the end of that year there is still an obligation for you to maintain it um, so it's worth bearing that in mind as well um, it's not a stepping stone it's it's a legitimate um, facility that has consequences for for um <clears throat> for that for its maintenance um and and i would strongly advise everybody if you get a chance to go and have a look at this um and 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 have a good look through the the, the landscape of it to find what 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 information there is to help you particularly topical god help us all at the moment is um on energy management and finding the best way to operate the school and finding the best way through uh our um our our complex system of of, of energy procurement to try and find the best rates and uh whatever information there might be available to help that in the current climate i think will be useful for you so do you want to just pop down one graham so among what my colleagues would talk about and highlight, well, I can't, I'm afraid, are, are what is available on this website, which is, begin, and they recommend that um, trusts, if they haven't done so already, just do a, a, a self-assessment check, which is basically answering yes, no questions to a list of things. Do you have? Are you able to? Which actually says you how well prepared you are for this sort of area of management um, of that building and energy management and the impact upon budgets. Um, it's very useful to do so, but there are, there's a health and safety tool. There's um, the performance and benchmarking checklist actually relates it, uh, uh, straight into energy management and um, uh, what you might be able to do to minimize or optimize the energy demands of the building once you inherit it. It is, Oh, what's worth saying, the building management systems are very sophisticated in, in these schools now, and they should all be operating automatically without constant amendment. And actually, constant amendment are one of the things that causes the problems. So you need to make sure that you're happy with the way it's programmed at the start, either towards 
um, uh, you know, energy management minimization or optimization, or a degree of flexibility to reflect the different uh, areas of the school and the different preferences of your staff and pupils. So building management systems um, are quite, quite an important thing for your technical people to get to handle on and for principals I would say in senior leadership to probably have a good overview of rather than knowing how to operate them in great detail because it is a sophisticated software package and it operates through laptops um, it's not it's not like go and hit the boiler with a with a wrench or anything these days it's extremely sophisticated so there are lots of information on that uh, website which I strongly recommend colleagues to have a look at either before handover or into their operation of the building. We'll pop on Graham, I'm getting to the end here now. So what, what you have uh, in, in, in approaching your new school are opportunities in terms of being able to manage it um, using an awful lot of data driven building management information on these systems now to try and optimize the way your energy uh, consumption works, um, making sure that it's as safe as possible uh, in terms of safeguarding how, how the building and the site is maintained and operated. And that as well as advice for individual schools, there are networking and benchmarking opportunities where you can compare yourselves with other schools, where you can actually talk to other schools outside trusts, other trusts, um, at, in terms of trying to handle some of the issues that you'll face in terms of building management and energy consumption. Um, and I, I think that's more and more important uh, as we enter this very difficult year ahead of us. Um, if you just pop on, Graham, I think there's just one more slide I wanted to mention. Um, you, you do need expertise now at this stage not not reliant upon the, on the principal you do need someone who's experienced in de in 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 building management that's really important for you just to ensure you got you understand what you're getting at the end of the handover process and for ongoing management of it and you do need to be aware that outside of um staffing costs the premises costs are or should be the, the, the next biggest cost and therefore it needs an appropriate amount of management and sensible um, budget allocation as well. And I think maybe one of the biggest issues outside of our current energy um, uh, um, cost prices is the net zero agenda, which we're all aware of, but at the moment there's not an awful lot of information on about how schools might approach that. And um, uh, the last slide on this, um, uh, which is a slide of a uh, just pop down to the next one, Graham. The last slide on this presentation is um, uh, the uh, uh, the is the references to um, another organisation. It offers all academies good estate management advice, and they themselves have um, a presentation on there, and as well as doing uh, their own featured presentations about. Uh, the net zero agenda and potential sources of funding that might be available to schools to assist with that. So I'd highlight that as, as a source of information for you. But generally speaking, um, uh, uh, the, the, the key messages here um, it are make sure you've got the right people involved, make sure that you're happy with all the documentation that you get, and that if you've got any issues at all about this now, um, that uh, your your individual project team, project director, project manager and technical advisor should be able to answer all of those issues with relation to your specific scheme. And I think I'll stop there. OK. Lovely, thank you, Ron. Um, I've just put a couple of links um, that Ron's referred to there in the chat. So the link to the Trust Network and to the um, the GEMS page on uh, DFE website. Um, as Ron says, if anybody does have any sort of more specific questions, please do pass those on and um, we'd be happy to come back to you uh, with an answer. But does anybody have any questions um, for Ron just off the back of that presentation for the time being? As I say, we'll send out the slides and give you a bit more time to digest some of that information as well. So if you do have any questions sort of following that, um, as I say, we're in contact with colleagues from the DFE, so please do just send over any questions. 
Yeah. Can I just ask, in terms of we're moving into temps, and I don't know how relevant this will be and how, we, whether you can give us an answer, but obviously this is a time consuming process, the handover and the moving into the building. Um, if we've already got the school running already in temps, have you got any advice for how we can manage that? Are we allowed to close the school temp like for a day, two days to move? Like, because obviously we need to be able to move all our equipment into the main building. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you should you should have had um, or should be able to have a very detailed conversation with your project team about the the decant exercise itself. The decant is usually included as part of the arrangements for you if you're moving from a temp site um, into a permanent site. Uh, closure days are, are fairly standard. I think that that's down to the individual governing body and the order trust to decide how much it might want to take. Um, we, 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 we commonly, when there are big moves, um, you can you can have up up to uh, I think five days is common in terms of uh, a move into if it has to happen in term time. We we all try and aim for a move that takes place so it overlaps with a holiday. Even though I know there are staffing issues about that, um, but but in the main. Um, I find that trust in schools, some staff or most staff want to be in to try and assist that to, to, to sort of familiarise their, their space to get it ready for, for pupils. So um, we sort of do take advantage of that a little bit. But yeah, you are, you are allowed to uh, have an organised closure day and notify your parents. And obviously that's where your individual project needs to be clear as early as possible to notify parents about any um, term time closure. But also the project would, should cover funding to allow for the movement that, of, of your furniture and equipment in the temps into the permanent building as well. Even if it's just across the field, there, there should be um, uh, a, 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 a company available to be able to do that through the main contractor that's building your, your permanent scheme. But I would talk to your project um, lead about that because uh, if that hasn't been discussed yet, it will be and you can go through so you're very clear and very comfortable with how it should work for you. Perfect, thank you. Right. Uh, and I'm sure Georgette yes. will be covering quite a bit of that uh, process as well in her presentation in just a moment. Um, and just quickly before we go on to that, um, just a quick one from Victoria. Uh, so that one year snagging period, would that include sort of questions that can be referred to the, uh, the contractors during that time? Uh, yeah, the one year, the one year defects and snagging period that they, they are required contractually to attend and address everything that is emerging in that one year period. Um, that they, it could be anything. It could be that some work hasn't yet been carried out, but we issued practical completion to allow the school to open. It could be that there's a snag that um, is a small problem, that recurring problem. The door doesn't shut properly, which they've got to come back and address. Or it could be a defect that, that emerges over the year that the heating doesn't work properly for whatever reason, or that there's a problem with the drain somewhere. All of those things have to be addressed by the contractor. Um, contractually, they have a prime responsibility in, 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 for 12 years, actually, to deal with all those issues. But it's only for the first year that those defects are actually part of our contract, part of their obligation, and for all three parties to be involved. They will still have that obligation as a contractor after the end of the first year, but, but the DfE will have stepped away. So that, that will be a responsibility of the trust to go direct to that contractor and deal uh, with, with getting them to come back to sort the issues out. You, you will have in the documentation that's given to you, you will have warranties for the, um, the performance of all aspects of the building. And those warranties are the things that transfer over to the trust and they retain the, uh, the responsibility of the contractor to come back and deal with those issues for that period. Is all right? So a bit waffly. No, thanks, Ron. I think that's really helpful. Lovely. Um, thank you for that, Ron. So without further ado, we'll hand over to Georgette, who, yeah, I'm sure will answer a few of those questions. Yes. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, Hannah, do you have my slides or should I share my own screen? I think we can, Graham, we've probably got them. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, 
I've got a terrible cold. You probably just see me sniffling on the camera. So you're lucky that you're meeting me virtually rather than in person today. Um, I'm Georgette Ailing. I'm head teacher at Bohunt Horsham. And we are, as Hannah said, a co-educational all through free school in West Sussex. Um, we're part of the Bohunt Education Trust. There's a film, um, Graham, if you can press play, um, which doesn't have sound. So as a, just a quick film from Waits who have built our school. I'm in the permanent build now for our very first term, having spent two and a half or two and a third years in temporary accommodation. And what I love about looking back on this film and why I wanted to start by sharing it with you today is that it makes this process look so easy. <laughs> and, and it really isn't. <laughs> And so it's it's very nostalgic for me to look back at this and think about how excited I was to imagine this building rising up out of the ground um, like some kind of film uh, when actually it's it's really a complex process. Um, and I know um, Ron has just really alluded to some of that. So I wanted to go through and, and talk to you about my journey this morning. And just identify some of the um, things I feel were positive and some of the things I would have done differently to, had I my time again. Graham, I think it stopped playing. Maybe you clicked on something else. Um, yeah, so we are a co-educational school. You can see that we're um, kind of three wings to the building plus a sports hall and a nursery. And the wing that's furthest over to the right is the primary school. The nursery is, is even further to the right than that. And then the other two wings are the secondary school. So we've moved in in a phased opening. So we've moved into the first two wings from the left and to the sports hall. Um, and the rest of the site is handed over to us at Easter. So we've got kind of an added complexity at the moment of sharing the site with Waits, who are our contractor. But that's our beautiful school in which I do sit this morning. So I suppose although um, that film just reminds me of, of quite how easy it wasn't, <laughs> it is really lovely to be able to say to you this morning that I am sitting here in the building that, that lots of people doubted uh, we'd be here by this point. Okay, so on my next slide, I'll start with some of the um, some of the points that I wanted to share with you. There's two selfies there. Those are um, absolutely supposed to be laughed at. Just to show you that, um, and you've alluded to this, I think, um, Naomi, just previously, working across two sites whilst also running a school is a huge undertaking for a principal designate for a head teacher. And it's really important, my overarching message this morning, is to acknowledge that in yourself that what you're doing is so many levels of complexity and to reach out and seek the support that you need. So getting to grips with the build process and yes absolutely we moved into temporary so that's two build processes um, and the picture in the centre you can see a picture of me with our trust uh, marketing coordinator and our local MP and in the background you can see our temporary school site. So we were in an adult learning centre there and we sought the support not just of people across the trust but also of local community members, our local MP being a really key individual in getting the school off the ground and keeping that momentum going. So the best thing I did in getting to grips with the build process was identifying my key supporters and keeping them really close. So however obsequious it may seem just really publicizing the support that they've given me giving them that support therefore back in turn what i would do differently and ron has already said this with the benefit of hindsight i definitely would have appointed a person with more experience to oversee the build project with me um, my project director karen summers is here on the call and, and she will attest to the journey of development <laughs> that i've been through in the last three years and there are so many things now that i know that i had no idea of three years ago but one of the key things is that as the person who was in every single buildings meeting, I ended up kind of positioning myself as the person who knew the answers to all the questions. And it was really difficult then for me to be able to step back from any of those meetings when school priorities needed my attention. So having somebody with me in those meetings who'd been there and knew the answers would have been really helpful. And the second thing in terms of the build process that I would have done differently is just to keep a record of each um, challenge that felt insurmountable at the time and how I overcame it or we rather overcame it. 
because it is a really stressful process and each obstacle that stands in your path to completion does at times feel overwhelmingly insurmountable. And when I look back on each of those now, I realise that with the support of my DFE team, of the contractors, of my staff team, parents, students and the local community, we did overcome those problems. And it's so helpful to be able to remind yourself that you've done something as difficult as this, that you have overcome a challenge of there being no bridge, of there being newts on your land. <laughs> um, actually, on reflection, many of them feel really insignificant. And at the time, they felt just so overwhelming. So on my next slide, I shouldn't get rid of my face. There's a lot of my face on that first slide. Um, my next slide, and, and actually I have the NSN to thank for this. Uh, my next slide is about managing parental engagement amid site delays. So we moved into our temporary accommodation in 2019. And the original timeline is that we'd spend a year in temps and then move into our permanent build. But very early on, in fact, probably um, before we even opened in 2019, it became apparent that there would be delays. And so we had gone out, as, as you will have done, and marketed ourselves to parents on our trust vision, on who we were as a school for the community, and partially on that brand new site. And we needed then to communicate to our parents at a really tricky time, probably around the same time that parents have um, two school offers to choose from, yours and an already established school, and explain how, uh, delays and where those had come from. And at a New Schools Network event, I had the advice from a, a previous head teacher to just be really honest and really transparent with parents. Um, I The best thing I did was to set up a parent reference group really early on and to use that group of parents, very different to a PTA, very different to an LGB, just a group of parents who would support and challenge me um, and my team. But what they did crucially was serve as a sounding board for me. So when I needed to communicate with the wider parent group about delays, I essentially rehearsed that with the parent reference group and got some really good feedback. So I'd written a letter. My parent reference group told me that I should do that by video message. This was kind of um, right in the middle of COVID, so I couldn't invite parents in. Um, and that advice was really, really positive. It meant I reached more parents and the message was just much more personal and felt much more honest. Um, so using them as a sounding board. Second best thing I did, I already said, come to an NSN meeting like this and take the advice of a head who told me to be honest and transparent. He told me that despite many delays he'd lost, or told us, many delays he'd lost no families because of delays to the build, and neither did we. And I've just been really open and honest with families about timelines, about what I do know, what I don't know, and, and crucially, what is most important is who we are as a school community celebrating that explaining that schools aren't about walls and buildings schools are about culture ethos um, and community and relationships so just really celebrating those things that would remain the same no matter where we were based and the third best thing i did was to hold lots of open events at the temporary site i held open and we've done the same here at the permanent school site although covid risk assessed um up to the eyeballs, um, not just open events for prospective parents, but for community members. I think it's easy to underestimate how important a new school is for your parish councillors, for your local businesses, for people who just have a real stakeholding in the local town, in the local community. So opening our doors at weekends and inviting those people in just to come and meet us and see who we are what I would do differently, and Karen will probably give a wry smile at this, is to get travel arrangements to and from the school site really clear in my mind. Um, I think it was really easy for me to um, recognise that in local authorities, um, really parents hold the responsibility to organise how children travel to and from school. But it is a real concern for parents. Um, and as we were a new, are a new school on a housing development, 
there's no public transport route to our school and so um actually getting on top of that and and taking some ownership of it early on that would have really served me well because actually it just would have sidelined a lot of questions that i've spent time answering over the last three years so i recognize how important that is to parents and i would have done that differently um on my next slide I'm talking about um, realising our vision in temporary accommodation. And I really echo what Ron said about the importance of your temporary school site. That is your school. And the best thing I did was stand really firm with the support of my mat on some specialist spaces. Um, so just, you know, different flooring in rooms so we could do science experiments on communal spaces, because as a new school, bringing your community together is how you create that culture. Um, and on negotiating some outdoor space. So I was able through a lot of wrangling um, to get a basketball court that was just next door to our temporary school that in year two we were able to use um, at break and lunch times to create a bit of breakout space for students. It is worth thinking in a worst case scenario that your temporary school might not be as temporary as you think and really making it a home and future proofing it and your DfE project managers and directors will probably already be thinking that way because they have a tendency um, to the, to the uh, pessimistic, <laughs> whereas a, a tendency to the optimistic. Second best thing I did in terms of the temporary school was investing in things that made it feel like home. Lots of photographs of students framed on walls, lots of artwork displayed, even if there's just three months in that accommodation. It's what creates your culture and that then is what you'll lift and take into your permanent school. It isn't that building that creates your culture. And so investing time and money into your temporary school is really important. It's also about training your students to treat that temporary building the way you want them to treat your permanent site. And we use the phrase stewardship. We talk about stewardship and the responsibility our students have to their environment. They have a real privilege to be given a brand new school and we feel they've moved into that brand new school already knowing how to treat it mostly. Um, what I would do differently, our third year was really difficult and um, we spent one more term in temporary accommodation, having added some porter cabins to the site and it was very cramped um, and that's during a time of, of COVID precautions which were really challenging and that term is a long, dark and cold one and we all know that as professionals who work in schools, so I think I, I could on reflection have made that term less challenging. And I think just investing in even in the last few weeks in that temporary school to make it easier for my colleagues who were then doing all the work to move us into the permanent school would have really paid off. So on reflection, I think I could have been a little bit less cautious with my spending in that first term. Um, next, I want to talk about the role of the DfE through the process, and it's a good job I'm not going to be rude about it because Karen's here, um, surprising me on a tile on the screen. Um, and that relationship between you and your DfE project directors, managers and advisors, as well as your contractors is really important. And hopefully Karen will agree that the best thing I did was build positive relationships. So. Um, public praise and taking the opportunity to thank and recognize the support that you get from all of those partnerships i think is really important and and it is what sees you through the moments of conflict and challenge and there are times where karen and i have really disagreed <laughs> and there are times i know she'll agree where i've thrown my toys out of the pram about something but actually spending the time and energy in in recognizing and acknowledging when things have gone right um, have been really important because this is a long relationship and um, we've been working together for over three years now second best thing i did was to use my dfe contacts to identify and then get out and visit other new schools and i absolutely welcome any of you to come and visit us i've put my email address at the end of the slides um, particularly useful was looking at those other new builds at hotspots so lesson transition social time start and end of the day there are really valuable lessons to be learned there what I would do differently, well, <laughs> it would take a minute taker to all meetings um, because this has been a really long process and having a record of all decisions, all actions and all questions would have really helped because, yeah, we have sometimes disagreed. <laughs> um, my next slide 
which is my final slide, is about the move into permanent accommodation. And I know this is um, questions that some of you had in the previous presentation. The move into permanent accommodation, it was really stressful. So we were with 450 students and 47 staff in permanent accommodation for over two years, so two years in a term, and you accrue a lot of stuff. So alongside all the fixed furniture and equipment that are transported by your um, decant team, who are organized for us by weights as our contractor, there's also just a lot of other stuff that, that congregates around that. So there's a huge amount to do in that move. I think the best thing I did was over the two and a half years to make key moments really transparent for our community. So everybody felt involved in the build. Um, we weren't able to bring our community into the build um, at all really because of COVID. And so we had lots of different events that made our students, our staff, our parents and other community stakeholders feel involved in that process. So all students and staff signed a lintel that now forms a part of the building structure. We had a naming ceremony and invited lots of um, local VIPs and some students to come along. Um, we did um, a, we do at the end of every term, restoration. So students as part of that stewardship piece, coming together to work on clearing, um, cleaning, recycling and restoring the building. And so we set that tradition up in the temporary school and we brought it with us into the permanent school. I also gave, and this alludes to the question you were asking about closure days, real time to staff for packing and moving. Um, so staff had, um, four days here at the permanent school once everything had been moved here by the decant team to unpack and set up their classroom spaces and some of that was the statutory health and safety training from the site team here from weights um, and some of that was the official handover process for me and other members of my premises team but lots of that time was just given over to staff to feel ready to welcome students and to induct students into the building and I think that was really important. It was a sacrifice and students have missed a lot of time in education, but we did run independent remote learning over those days and parents were not um, had no objection to it. Uh, second best thing I did was at the beginning of um, students first day here at the permanent site, I got community support wardens and local police officers on site to help with pick up and drop off because we all know that even if you're expecting lots of students to come by bus or walk or cycle that on the first day of their new school lots of parents will drive those children into school many more than you are expecting and then will be really cross that there's a problem with traffic that is of their own making so inviting those um community support wardens and local police officers in really took the pressure off me um, so I didn't have to be out there and my team directing traffic we could be welcoming students and making that really smooth as a start so just anticipating those problems and trying to make that day positive for yourself um, and as, as little stress as possible on that very first day of term, and I stood out at the front gates of the building um, from very, very early. So that's once we'd had those four days of staff setting up and the first day of term for students waiting for the first buses and cars to arrive. Um, it was a really emotional moment for me. It also was the moment where I felt like I hit the wall in terms of exhaustion. Everything you've done has built up to that point that moment where students and staff are in that building. So it's really important to set aside some time on that first day to give yourself a moment just to stop. Because actually my experience is you won't be capable of doing anything other than stopping. So do carve that time out just to stop and look at what you've accomplished because it's huge. What I would do differently is to realize that just because this school is absolutely my passion project and I think about it in my every waking moment and some of my sleeping ones too, um, that doesn't mean it's everybody else's. And so your staff may well, like mine, move into the brand new building and be really thrilled and excited with it. And some of them are just coming to work. 
and will be slightly dissatisfied with how you laid out the food technology room or which way around the teacher desk is in the IT room and decisions that you made many, many moons ago. And it's really important to put something in place to make sure that those gripes and moans bypass you because you will, if you're anything like me, take them really personally. Also, I would get real clarity, and, and Ron said this earlier too, on site security and access processes, really early on getting a walkthrough of how those things work, because the thing I suppose that really surprised me on handover day was the weight of responsibility on my shoulders for this building and the land that goes with it. It's actually an enormous privilege and something that we are stewards of for our local communities and will exist far beyond us um, and serve the community well after we're gone. So recognising that you suddenly take um, responsibility for that is huge. And so preempting the stress of that by just being really confident on how you will keep that site secure and safe would be um, something I'd really recommend. So in the final slide, um, you can see an image of my school community uh, from a drop down day, a curriculum drop down day last term in temporary accommodation with some artwork that the whole school joined together to make and um, just wanted to share that kind of um, artifact of our culture with you as I finished and just show you that my email address is on the slides, which I think you will get copies of. I'm really happy to answer questions. Um, and to welcome visitors and tours. Thank you very much. Lovely, thanks so much, Georgia. That's, yeah, some really um, inspiring words there. Um, has anybody got any questions? If not, I've got just one for you, Georgia. And, and how have you found sort of being in, I know it's still early days, but sort of how, how's it been? How's the sort of communication been with weights and has there been anything that sort of cropped up at this stage? You know, how do you sort of, how supported do you feel now that you're in? Oh, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time just walking around feeling really smug and I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> I, I think it's a beautiful building and it, it is the site that our students and our staff um, and our local community deserve. Um, mm -hmm. Working with Waits has been a real pleasure. They have been really supportive. They're, we're working, as I said at the beginning, right alongside one another and they have been incredibly responsive to our snagging but also just to um, slightly adapting their ways of working to make that work better for us so I don't have any complaints there um, and I've been really supported by my DFE team in that also um, because you know Karen and well that's our bell sorry <laughs> actually hate our bell <laughs> um, it's the end of break um, so yeah, really responsive to any questions or concerns that I have had. Yeah. Good, good. Um, just had a question here from Tracy. Um, yes, Tracy, if you pop onto the hub, if you'd like to ask that question on the hub, then I'm sure um, some of our 2021 openers and beyond would um, be really happy to share some of that. We've got some videos on there as well um, from other schools that have been through the DCAM process as well. So I'm sure um, it's a really good community, as I'm sure Georgette will attest to in terms of sharing um, materials and things like that. I'll pop the link in the chat there. And um, we're just going to put up a quick poll. So thank you uh, to everybody that's already given us uh, a bit of feedback. If you could just log that just by clicking a little button that's going to pop up in a minute. Um, we will be taking uh, a break over half term with these events. So our next one will be on the 22nd um, of February. Uh, so we hope to see you there. That will be on the Ofsted pre-registration um, and readiness to open meeting process, which uh, is obviously one of your, the big milestones coming up. Your apologies, I know that half term is a bit variable across the country. Um, if you're not able to take that time off, obviously we will be recording the session as we have been uh, with all of them.